Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Once while I was traveling, I was in the city of Ankara, and there's a, an old city, and in the old city, there's a mosque where a famous, a famous Sufi saint is buried adjacent to the mosque. His name is Haji Bayram, and uh, people come, <clears throat> And they pray at his uh, resting place. While I was there, somebody took me around to the back of the mosque, and we went down a couple of floors. And there, underneath of the mosque, there was a, let's call it a cave, where Sufis would go and go into isolation for a period of 40 days. They would go into this dark place and they would be given a little bit of food every day. But other than that, they were left on their own in this place that had no light. And in this place, they were isolated from their senses, essentially. Um, we are all aware that if we walk into a dark room, we can't see. We can't see because we need light to see. Um, what we're actually seeing, whenever we're looking at anything, is the reflection of light. Uh, these things, the reflection comes into our eyes our eyes somehow create an image inside the eye, and this image is transferred into our mind, and we then are able to see and understand what it is we see. That's how the senses work. We touch things, and the mind tries to figure out what we touch, and we then come to some sort of conclusion. There's uh, the famous story of men all touching an elephant in the dark, and the different men, depending on what part of the elephant they were touching, came to different conclusions. The ones who felt his leg said he was a pillar, the ones who felt his ears said he was a fan. The ones who felt his back said he was a wall and so on. So our sense perception without light is quite different than our sense perception in light. But the one thing that light and darkness as far as perceiving have in common is they are perceptions. We see things in a certain way and the mind reacts in a certain way. Now we are constantly traveling with our mind and our mind is constantly having an ongoing conversation internally. Even though we may be as still as we can be, there will be an ongoing conversation in our mind. And this ongoing conversation has to do with what it is that we at that moment are thinking that we need, or thinking that we desire, or thinking that is out of place, or thinking needs to be corrected, or thinking needs something done with so that things can become at peace or at some sort of uh, stillness. We, all of us, have these priorities 
that we've set up in our being as to how things should work, how things should move forward, what it is we have to do, and how things should be done. Now, we've talked a lot about how the universe is in constant movement. It never stops. We also are in constant movement. And that movement, a large part of it, is in our mind. And that movement is usually in relationship to some kind of external situation that we are reacting to and that we are trying uh, to put into a state that satisfies well how our imagination thinks it should be. The people who write about these things and the people who talk about these things and the mystics call this dualism. The separation between what's outside and you and your reaction to what's outside, what's outside of yourself. Now, we already know that everything is in constant movement. Even if we are sitting still, being as motionless as we possibly think that we can be, we all know if it's pointed out to us that we are on the earth, which is a revolving sphere that's traveling around the sun at a certain speed and also revolving around its axis at a certain speed. So as still as you may think you are, you are still in constant motion, in constant traveling. Now, the mind has this constant relationship with the outside world. And the mind grasps on to things in the outside world and tries to manipulate them somehow. It is in these acts of manipulation that all sorrow exists, that all difficulty exists. It's in this constant trying to alter the external world that we run in to difficulty. But the question comes, how do we stop this constant interface with external things and the constant attempt to alter them? Well, this has to do with expectations, and this has to do with desire, and this has to do with internal needs. There's a story that tries to explain this external reaction and the illusory nature of this external reaction and a methodology to be able to detach from all of these external reactions. There was a king, and there was a play being put on within one of the main halls in the palace. And they needed a princess who would be about five years old to play the part of the princess. But they had no little girl at that moment. And the queen said, why don't we use the prince? He's five years old. We'll dress him up as a little girl. We'll put him on stage, and that'll resolve that problem. And they did. And the princess, uh, the queen rather, said afterwards, the little prince looks so beautiful in his, in his dress and his makeup. Why don't we make a painting of it? So one of the artists within the palace came 
and made a painting of the little prince as a princess. Um, the queen got the painting. She thought it was beautiful, and they put it away somewhere where they store things. Fifteen years later, the prince is now 20 years old, and he's rummaging through artifacts from the palace. And while he's doing it, he comes across this painting of this little princess. And he looks at her, and he falls in love. And he says to himself, I have to marry this princess. She's probably grown by now, and I have to find her. But he's shy, so he doesn't say anything to his parents. And one of the ministers notices that he's troubled and comes to him and says, you can confide in me. You can tell me what's troubling you. I'll keep it confidential, and maybe I can help you. So he takes the minister to the painting, and he shows him the painting. And the minister has been around since then, and he, he knows what the painting really is. And the, he says to the prince, you're going to have to sit down for this. And the prince sits down, and he explains to the prince about the fact that there was a play. They didn't have a little girl. And they got the prince to dress up as a little girl, and they used him in the play. And this painting is not what he thought it was. It's not a painting of a young princess. It's actually a painting of him. And as soon as he understood that, his attachment to this painting went away. His need, his desire for what was in this painting went away. His desire dissipated. His attachment dissipated. He no longer had a relationship with what was in the painting. Everything that we have a relationship that's outside of ourselves is illusory. Until we understand the illusory nature of it, the mind will continue to have its relationship which has expectations, which has desire, and which has needs, which causes us confusion and sorrow. Only when that is somehow cut can we end that relationship. Now, how are we going to cut it? Imagine if you have been spending your life trying to escape from somebody who's chasing you. And everything you do involves keeping away from this person. And then at a time when you're alone uh, and you're sitting in, a, um, in your home, somebody comes to visit you and they tell you that the person you're trying to escape from died three years ago. Well, imagine how your life would change all of a sudden, everything that you have been focused on, which is to escape from this person, no longer is relevant because this person no longer exists. All that was going on was that you had this person in your mind and that mind picture that you had of this person was your reality. Even though they didn't exist anymore, they existed in your mind. And illusion is like that. Everything that we are attached to is a picture in our mind. Everything that we think about is somehow settled in our mind. Now, imagine if you can bypass the mind and its interaction with things and its need to fulfill its desire, it to, to fulfill its needs. Imagine 
if you can go to a place of quietude where whatever comes comes whatever goes goes but your own personal involvement is not there can we be free of desire can we be free of needs and in that moment can we be free of the mind can we be free of the imaginations that pull us in different directions can we be free of praise and blame can we be free of the machinations of the world around us and enter into a space where we are without attachment to any of these things. In Sufism, one of the goals is to get to that place where we are without these kinds of needs to get to the place where we understand that the physical world is an illusion an illusory place that we live in and because of our mind and sense interaction with all of the elemental things around us we create scenes we create ideas we create scenarios we create plots we create dramas that we interact in as if our life depended on them that we interact in in a way that they become incredibly important to us and <clears throat> we try very very hard to push things in a certain direction now we all understand if we've been doing this for a while that god is the doer not ourselves well if god is the doer and the universe is in constant motion and the world is in constant motion can you imagine removing yourself from active uh, participation and allowing everything around you to move on its own and accepting the way that it moves now we don't live isolated our lives are in the world we don't live in the forest where we lay down wherever we're at at that moment and go to sleep there and eat whatever fruit is available for us from whatever tree we need to be around we have to do certain things in order to keep things going we have to put food in the refrigerator somehow we need beds in order to sleep in we need a house and we have jobs now that means that within the realm of all of the things that we do can we do the appropriate thing and just keep moving on can we allow what happens to happen without regret without joy without involvement without trying to force things in a way that they can't be forced that have to do with our own desires our own needs our own sense of imagination and our own lower self which tries to make everything turn out so that it somehow benefits ourselves can we just do things and whatever the outcome is we say alhamdulillah all praises to god this is the way it's supposed to be can we remove ourselves from ourselves can we lose ourselves to ourselves can we get ourselves out of the equation can we get our emotions out of the equation can we get our needs 
out of the equation? Can we get our desires out of the equation? Can we move through the world without involvement in the world? Can we let things go on without pushing and pulling them and causing all kinds of drama in our lives? Can we remove ourselves from the drama? Can we be at peace no matter what the chaos around us appears to be? Can we internalize who we are to the deepest portion of ourselves that isn't affected by the, the illusory nature of the elemental world that surrounds us and that we constantly interact with? Can we limit our interaction to the least amount possible so that we can do what it is that we have to do and do it competently and appropriately and then move on? When I first started uh, practicing law and I was first involved in uh, cases. I used to come home every day and tell my wife everything that happened and what I was doing and trying to, to think about how to do this and how to do that. After about two or three years, I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And I had gotten to the point where when I was working on it, I was working on it. But when I wasn't working on it, it didn't stay with me. So it's like a shadow that you can't let go of. Can you do what you're supposed to do and then let go of it? Can you move through your life without taking everything that you've been involved in and carrying it on your back like a donkey? A man who is a true man wakes up every morning free. A man who is attached to all of his previous experiences wakes up every morning with a burden on his back like a donkey. And it makes it hard for him to move. It makes it hard for him to do anything. He comes under tremendous pressure because of all of the problems that exist in his mind and all of the things that he has to resolve. Now, to do this means becoming detached from desire, becoming detached from all of the needs that you've spent a lifetime accumulating and think you need, becoming detached from all of the things that your culture, dependent on your culture, tells you you need and tells you you have to do. Now, I'm familiar with some foreign cultures because I've, I've traveled a bit. In some countries, people are afraid to get married until they have enough money to buy a house or an apartment and furnish it. If they can't get to that point, they can't get married. So people wait until their mid-30s to get married because they don't have enough prior to that. When I got married, I had literally nothing. We had enough money to put down on an apartment. But if we hadn't have got married, what would we have done? And I came to the conclusion that things can get built up as we go along. And that's exactly what happened. But in the process of spending a lifetime building up desires and trying to fulfill them, in a lifetime of doing this, to change course and begin to say that none of these desires have real fulfillment in them, none of these desires will take me from a state of difficulty to a state of peace, to actually believe that 
is a difficult thing to do because your mind has been adapted to thinking that you need all these things. You've actually become addicted to thinking that you need all of these things. You, you are so attached to them that you think your life is altered if you don't have them. So as you begin to work on your addiction, you have withdrawal symptoms. In the same way that somebody who drinks alcohol and stops alcohol has withdrawal symptoms, in the same way that somebody does whatever drugs they inject has withdrawal, sim withdrawal symptoms after they stop, people have withdrawal symptoms from their desires. All of a sudden, they begin to think, well, how can I possibly live without these things? And they know they want to give them up, but then they become sad because they have to give them up. These things were like part of their being. But what needs to be understood is that there is a limit to your consciousness that's held in place by desire. And to break through that, there is another level of consciousness that happens when desire is gone. But you can't understand that or feel that or know that until you break through desire. So it's really difficult to understand a state that you're not in. It's really difficult to imagine a state that you don't know because we're kind of limited to what we do know. And we think what we know is through our mind and through our sense perception through our mind. But do we have the courage to move beyond what we know? And this is the big point. This is not a path for cowards. Cowards fall to the wayside. Cowards can't move forward. Cowards are happy to keep what they have and to leave the status quo alone. It takes bravery to move into the unknown and give up everything that you have. Give up all of your ideas, give up all of your notions, give up all of your desires, give up your mental processes as to what you think you need and don't need. In essence, give up the attachment to what the machinations of the mind tell you is real and begin to understand that there is a reality that is beyond what you know and it's something that you've never seen and until you break through what you have seen and give up what you know, you can't understand this new reality. You can't understand a way of seeing that you haven't seen yet. Imagine traveling to a place that's unlike anything you've known where you are. You'd have to learn a new language. You'd have to learn how to eat new foods. You'd have to learn the culture of the place that you're in. And you'd have to learn how to fit into that culture in order to be able to get along. Well, there is a world outside of the world of emotions. There is a world outside of the world of desire. There is a world outside of the lower self that is constantly and only interested in making yourself better or richer or more famous or wealthier or more important. There's a world entirely 
outside of that. There's a world where mercy and compassion are the operative words. There's a world where kindness is the operative attitude between people. There's a world where there are no differences among men, where there are no differences among beings, and everyone treats everyone else as if they were themselves. That place exists. It has to exist within us. But how can we bring ourselves to that place? How can we bring ourselves to that place of no differences, to that place of no needs, to that place of no involvement, to that place where we don't care about the elemental world and all of the things that it does and says and, and moves at us? Can we go to the place where praise doesn't affect us any differently than blame? Can we go to the place where we see all people alike, no matter what their race, no matter what their religion, and no matter what their attitude towards us is? Can we find that place that moves with the movement of all of creation without trying to push things and pull things and make things happen according to our imagination? Can we give up? our imagination? Can we allow what is going to happen to come before us so that we can see it and take that in and begin to understand reality from that point of view? Can we let God show us as opposed to having ourselves insist on what's next? Can we allow Allah to bring us into that open space that is his open space? Or do we insist that everything has to go according to our own laid out plans as to how things have to be? Can we, have, can we be satisfied, content, peaceful, and serene within our situation? Or does our situation have to change to meld with our imagination before we can find contentment. Can we be content for the sake of God? Can we be content in our knowledge that God exists and takes us to all the appropriate places? Can we be content in the knowledge that God exists and shows us all the appropriate things we are supposed to see? Can we be content in the fact that there is perfection in all of existence. We just need to be able to see it better. So can we get to the point where we stop trying to change it so that it meets our mind's satisfaction? Can we stop relying on our mind to be the arbiter of what's good and bad? Can we understand reality from Allah's perspective. The Sufis say, if you get to know yourself, you will know your Lord. Well, your true self, our true self, is beyond our mind. Our mind is an elemental force tied to the elemental forces in this illusory world. And to bypass that and to get to reality we have to give up our reliance on this mind. We have to give up our reliance on our knowing and become part of that which is all knowing. And to do that, change has got to come. And change is hard because we have to go through that period of adjustment while change is happening. We have to get over our addictions. We have to be able to give up that which we hold sacred. And that means everything that we have set on pedestals.
that means that we can't treat plate, things that are silver plated as if they're silver. We can't treat things that are painted as if they were really that way. We have to go towards the core of things and we have to understand that the mind can't go there. Desire can't go there. Our needs can't go there. The only thing that can go there is the deepest essence of our inner being that is connected to truth and not connected to the world. So we have to pray. We have to pray that all of these things that separate us from reality become separated from ourselves so that all that's left is reality. All that's left is our understanding of truth. All that's left is our connection to truth, not our connection to this world. Ya Allah, bring us to that place where we leave our mind. Bring us to that place where we leave ourselves, where we give up ourselves and enter into your sphere of truth, your sphere of reality, where we understand that nature and give ourselves up to that. Allow us to enter into the movement that is constantly going on into the universe as opposed to our own peripheral actions that we think somehow are necessary for our existence. Take us to the place where makes us understand who you are and our true nature, which is intertwined with you. This is our work. This is our path. And to do this, we have to give up this attachment to emotions, to drama, to the world, to all of the things that we've held on our entire life. We have to give them up somehow. We have to relieve ourselves of ourselves. We have to do away with our attachment to everything around us and our attachment to ourselves. We, ha we, all, we all have this little, this little man or woman floating inside our head, and that's us. And we spend a lifetime trying to polish it and comb it and dress it and take care of it and make sure it has all of the wonderful things in this world. Well, all of the wonderful things in this world become available to you when you let go of yourself because the true self is other than your imagination. So we have to get out of our imaginations. May Allah help us relieve ourselves of our imaginations and be able to face the truth that is his truth and then find true serenity, true joy, through true peace, not connected to this elemental world. Let us bypass illusion and come to the shore of reality. Allah, do this for each of us. Ameen, ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa